Are you ready for this? We're here! Hi, what's your name? I'm Joe Fowler. Hi, I'm Ron Popeil. I've chose anybody. Hi, what's your name? I'm Tom Purvis, trainer to the trainers. And Hi, I'm Mike Levy. Hold on to your power rod. But wait. What are you doing? Call now. Call now. Call now. Call now. Call, now. Call, now. Call or log on now. Call now. Call right now. Call in the next 18 minutes. Call in the next 16 minutes. Call in the next 7 minutes. Call these numbers right now. Hey, hello and welcome to Call Now, where we plunge headfirst into the surreal world of infomercial. And while we can't offer you free shipping, we can guarantee that the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are definitely those of this network. Thank you, Tim. My name is Dan Sturdivant. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host on this three-man we've known as Call Now. And listen, this guy doesn't even need special clothes. It's Mark Pedrotti. Wait. Oh, yeah. You can't see me. You can't see anything about me. Now, Jan, I can get into girl and you'll be stunned to see what this guy can smoothly cover with one coat in under 60 seconds it's dave sandrini hello dave well i have a coat is that gonna be a problem (laughs) that's sweet but this week we had the opportunity to speak with someone that i've known by name for the past i don't know two plus decades he's a first bout hall of famer he's one of the founding fathers of my infomercial obsession And our most loyal fans will recognize him from episode number 10 when we covered the Home Right Pain Stick, as well as the 25th episode Pitch People documentary discussion. That's right. We sat down and caught up with the one and only Jan Mullen. We're definitely getting spoiled here at Call Now. I mean, maybe we need to be vacuum sealed. Huh? All right, sorry. I'll I'll save the bad puns. (laughs) Maybe you need to be cleaned with the Koblenz keening machine. (laughs) Ooh, there you go. Stay bagged and put away somewhere. That's it. Ooh, we're getting too dirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. But yeah, so I mean, obviously, you have over forty-five years in the housewares industry. Well-known, well-recognized, award-winning infomercial spokesperson and QVC guest, and perhaps most importantly, especially. If we assume that the world revolves around me and me alone, which is a fair assumption. I mean, we're sitting down with the person that I credit for the start of my obsession with infomercials, but also the inspiration for my first great bit as a kid. That's right. It's Call Now Hall of Famer, Mr. Jan Muller. Uh, Officially, welcome to the show. We're honored to have you here with us. Great to be here. I want to hear the bit. So we are, <laughs> I have two older sisters. We're riding home from dinner out. We didn't go out to dinner all that much. It was an event when we did. Went to a steakhouse, all fired up, heading back home. We got our leftovers in the car. You know, the conversation hits a lull, a little bit quiet. So I start to pipe up and I grab my styrofoam shell container and I start, this is not your voice, but it's your bit about the love. They're not leftovers. It's me love. So I'm going, <laughs> Second servings of love. Second <laughs> servings of love. So my family lost it. I think it prolonged my parents' marriage for an additional six years. So better or worse on that side. But <laughs> yeah, the car went nuts. And that's when I was like, you know what? Infomercials are pretty great. And uh, maybe I'll try to be funny from time to time. Seems to ease the tension a little bit. So yes, yeah, so that, that's your fault. This is on you, Jan. All right. Okay, I take full responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I take full responsibility. No, yeah, you don't seem like someone who shirks accountability for things. So no. I appreciate that. No. But yeah, I mean, we've really only scratched the surface of your work here on the show so far. Like we touched on a little bit. We had the Pitch People documentary breakdown that we did. And then we're able to talk to Stan Jacobs, who is incredible and infomercial legend in his own right. And he also mentioned that, you know, coincidentally, the first time that you landed on his radar was also the first time you landed on ours, and it was with the Home Right Paint Stick. Mm-hmm. And looking back through the chronology of things, it seems like you know, you'd been on the pitch circuit for a while. Leading up. You were hitting the pavement. You were doing the full tour. 15 years. Tour. Oh, wow. 15 years. 15 years. And then it seemed like the paint stick with Nancy was really where things kind of cracked wide open. And then you went from being Jan Muller to Jan Muller. Pitchman. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I had a lot. I had. I had a lot of work in those ten years, from 1991 to 2003. I guess whatever it is, 12 years. A lot of work, and uh, very grateful for it. The paint stick. This was a great story. So the paint stick. I'm not sure where Dan. Uh, I can't remember his last name. And their company in Minneapolis. 
they had nothing to do with, you know, painting or anything like that. They, they were about hydraulics and selling hydraulics all over the world for planes and all this other stuff. Oh, wow. And I guess his father decided there's got to be a better way to paint a wall than having to keep going back and forth into the thing and dripping it all over. So he invented the paint stick, which is actually just a hydraulic. It's like a big hypodermic needle. Yeah. They must have seen, I think he saw the Mantra infomercial. I think that was the first one I did. I could have them backwards. I'm not sure. But that first paint stick was supposed to shoot from nine in the morning till six at night. We were in New York City. It went until six the next morning. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, we were up, the, the crew, everybody. Wow. Uh, and they, they started at six in the morning as I did that day. And it went till six in the morning because it was such a small budget. We had only one wall to paint. <laughs> so when we painted that <laughs> wall, <laughs> if I messed up or if something happened with the tape oh or whatever, we had to let it dry Wow. <laughs> and then come back in and do the bit again. Right. Wow. You know, paint the wall in six seconds. Or so something. how many times? Oh, it was brutal, dude. It was <gasps> brutal. And I had a airing that day at QVC with food saver. So, and my airing was like at 10 a.m. So they threw me into a, a limo. They were going to just let me find my way back. Oh my God. <laughs> from the night before, but they gave me a limo. He drove me right to QVC. I went in, I set up, went on <laughs> with a food saver. And did well, you know, did well, just did the food saver pitch. Oh, my God. But uh, when he called me up the next time, he said, listen, we did really well with that infomercial. We're going to shoot another one, but we're going to have an audience. We're going to have a full studio. Uh, and I promise you'll have more than one wall to paint. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I was going to say, was this yeah. with the crowd? I'm like, were you holding those 20 people hostage for this full 25 hours? But okay, at least this was a separate incident. Good. <laughs> right, right, right. right. First one, paint stick number one. Wow, yeah. wow. My gosh. And that ran for like five years, six years. It was amazing. No, yeah. yeah. It's so believable because you run in the room with a paint stick and immediately paint the wall and you're like, shit, this is like the best thing I've ever seen. It's easy. I know. Let me give yeah. you a little bit more background. So my wife at the time, I had just started dating. So this is 30 years ago. And they sent me the paint stick and I was a guy at that time that anything that was plastic, I wasn't interested in. Because I was selling the commercial osterizer blender on the fair and show circuit for 15 years, right? Yeah. So I was all into, if it's not stainless steel, if it's not made out of metal, it can't be any good. So yeah. I brought the paint stick over to her um, house. And I said, I don't think I you know, I want to do this because it's made out of plastic. She said, well, have you tried it? Does it work? Fair question. <laughs> and I said, no, I haven't tried it. Why would I try it? I'm a pitch man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to know what this thing does. It's got to talk. Yeah. <laughs> so she says, well, let's paint my bedroom and we'll see if it works. I went, okay. So I went and bought the paint, did the whole thing. It was phenomenal. She said, if you don't want to do it, I will. Wow. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll do it. So she actually That's got awesome. me into the infomercial business and my first big hit. Wow. So I had to marry her. Oh, Good yeah. move. Smart man. Mark, you have one, right? Yeah. Sorry. I, I had the Wagner. Yeah. 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 It's a descendant. Yeah. They're linked up though, right? Yeah. Familiar with it. Yeah. But Jenny, if you look, this room was painted by the Wagner. Beautiful job. Yeah. Now, did your wife do it? <laughs> <laughs> she, she went around the door. She did most of it, but no, it's. She did the quick painter. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Nice color on that wall back there. I like it. I was already married at the time. So it wasn't like I was courting at that point while we were contemplating the painting. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that's a good move. That's always good. You were secure enough to do your own painting. Yeah. That's a good yeah. one. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. Was that the first time you had worked with Nancy? Because I know that obviously you two with the food saver is kind of its own. Yeah. To me, legendary run of things. I always wanted to work with Nancy in every infomercial. I pushed for them to hire her for everything that I got hired for. And the reason is, is because when we met on the paint stick set, she was so darn easy to work with. Pro. She just, nothing bugged her, nothing bothered her. She kept coming up with new lines every single time we did. She reacted to me. We had no script. I knew what I was gonna say because I needed to say something in the pitch. Yeah. 
to sell the product. But I told her, I said, let's just have a conversation, you know, just work off of whatever I'm saying. It worked so well. And again, in the second one, that when Food Saver approached me, now I was selling, I actually was part of the group that discovered the Food Saver in 1985 at the Pomona Fair, the LA County Fair. Oh, wow. Okay. So I was down there with my company and three other guys were in the company. It was called Nationwide Industries. And we were at the LA County Fair. We had five booths and we were selling the VTEC four-in-one machine, which was a bread maker, a blender, a food processor, and a um, mixer. So we had huge booths there. And we had yeah. five of them in all the buildings. And the one I Jesus. was working in was a back-to-back booth. It was about 40 to 60 feet wide, about 80 to 100 feet long. It was Whoa. in the center of the building. We had a curtain in the middle. So we had two booths pitching both ways. That is enormous. Audience. Wow. So this guy comes walking up to our closing booth where you sign up people for the machine. And he comes walking up. He's got a jacket on a sport coat on. He's got this machine under his arm and he's got some things in his hand and he walks up to our booth and he said, I have this new machine. I'm from Switzerland and I flew over here to find somebody that would want to sell and import this machine. And you guys have the biggest booths. Yeah. (laughs) You guys look like you might be able to afford it. (laughs) No, but so you must know what you're doing. Yeah. We were hoping people would think that. Holy shit, it worked. (laughs) It was me, two other pitch people. And we had a backer that was, you know, backing our being able to take this machine, the VTech out to fairs and shows. So we started looking at it and he, he had some cheese. He had some other stuff. And he literally did the demonstration right there on our little table. So my partner, Bob, Bob Warden, who's another guy you should have on. Love to. Said, we got to do this. And I said, Bob, we're right in the middle of launching the VTech machine. I mean, (laughs) this is what, no, 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 no. This is a breakthrough. This is something. I said, okay, great. You just talk with him about that. I'll get back up on the box and start my hour. So anyway, Short story, I left that company, I moved to Hawaii, started another pitch business, and Bob and Sintra, his wife, Sintra Warden, they took on the Food Saver, and they did the first Food Saver infomercials. Whoa. Now, I don't know if you remember them. They did like two or three. They were in Costco. Oh, get out of here. They shot everything in Costco. <laughs> the whole thing? Wow. And they were phenomenally successful. I mean, the machine just took off. Then I came back to the mainland because Bob talked me into it. I came back to (laughs) Food Saver Company in 1989. And in 1993, 92, 93, the then president of the company said she wanted to do a Food Saver infomercial. So I said, great, you've got to hire Stan Jacobs and you have to hire Nancy Nelson. No kidding. She said, no, 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 no. I have somebody in the business that's been doing commercials for years. Different sport. And he hasn't done an infomercial, but he knows he, he's sure he can do it. I said, you're wasting <laughs> the company's money. You need to hire Stan <laughs> Jacobs and Nancy Nelson and we'll have a winner. I've already got the pitch. So just yeah. film it. No, 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 no. <laughs> so we shot that. It failed miserably. So she hired Stan and Nancy. Of course. And then we had like four or five. Easy fix. We've shot a new one every two years for 10 years. Man, if only someone had told her that up front. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't worry on that, Chan. No. Yeah. Well, that was similar to one of Stan's <laughs> stories with um with Kathy. With Kathy, yeah. When he's going, oh, we'll just get anybody to do this, and he's like, not anyone can just do this. <laughs> right. Get Kathy. <laughs> right. What he said was, and it's really true, mm-hmm. is not everyone can cook and talk at the same time. Yeah. At the same time, and exactly. make sense and sell the product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's because Kathy was a pitch person. So yep. the yeah. most successful infomercials have been, most of them, most successful ones have been with people that learned how to pitch. Yep. Yeah. And the most entertaining ones. Yep. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Who was that? <laughs> no, but, but no, no, seriously. That's it. Yeah. No BS on that yeah. one. I feel like we're getting to the point now where we can sniff out if it's a true pitch person or not. Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Easily. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. 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 On that concept and topic of like the true pitch people thing, you guys were back to back in the pitch people documentary with Chet. Yeah, Chet and Aaron. With Chet and Aaron. And do you actually study like with and from Chet? Was that part of your foundation of getting into 
the pitch business and kind of learning the craft? So in 1976, my son was five years old. My wife was pregnant with our second child due in August. And we were at the Del Mar County Fair in San Diego. And we would go every year and we would bring just enough money, 20 or $30, to buy the commercial Osterizer blender. And we would go there and stand and watch him put the egg in and it would come out the strawberry milkshake and he had on this white, you know, medical thing and he had a <laughs> microphone and the lights and the mirror. <laughs> and every year we would go, it would be $10 more mm-hmm. and we couldn't buy it. So this particular year, I was out of work. I have done a lot of things over the last five years, but I was out of work. And we went to the fair and I saw him again and I was so enthralled with the whole thing. I walked up to him at the end of his pitch and said, I want to do this. Would you hire me? And he said, go away. (laughs) Don't come back. I'm working here. So I went away. I came back an hour later after he was done his next pitch. And I said, listen, I know I can do this. I want to do this. Hire me. Teach me how to do this. He said, get out of here. I don't hire people. We don't hire people. I do this. This is my business. This is all I do. I don't hire people. Yeah. Well, we went away. We walked around some more, ate another waffle cone or whatever. <laughs> Got more indigestion. And then you were fired up. You're ready. <laughs> right. Exactly. Came back again. And he said, all right, listen, give me your address. Because back then, you had to give somebody your address for them to send you something. Oh, yeah. Mail, right? <laughs> Mail? What's that? Give me your address. I'll send you the pitch, and you need to memorize it. Meet me in Ventura, and I'll pay you like, I don't know, like 40, 50 bucks a day. It was a five-day fair, and we'll see if you can do it. Wow. So I memorized it. I had a machine. I think he sent me a machine. He may not have. No, he hadn't sent me a machine. I just memorized the script, the pitch. And went there to Ventura and the Friday that he took his girlfriend, who was the other pitch person with him there, took him out. They said, listen, nobody comes here on Friday nights. It's beer night. So you'll just get a bunch of people that are drunk on beer. Good luck. (laughs) You'll get some people coming back to pick up their machine. If you want to try and practice the demo, go ahead. So I did. I got up there. I put on the microphone. I had the script right next to me and I'm reading it while I'm fumbling around and doing this stuff. And like halfway through, I look up and I've got like 20 people listening. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) When'd you get here? (laughs) So, yeah, no, I'm practicing. Go away. No, (laughs) put your money away. I'm working here. Stop, stop. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. So from six until 10 o'clock, when they closed the building, I just kept doing it over and over again. I sold like 20 machines. Whoa. I was hot. I was done. I called my wife and I said, honey, honey, I'm hired. <laughs> <laughs> I got the gig. I'm going to be doing this. I'm making money. So that was Dave Sterling. Great guy. And he had been doing this since he was like, I don't know, 18 or 19 years old. And I ran into him, I guess, when he was like 30 or 32, something like that. And so I learned everything I could from him. And then I worked with Chris Wilson. I worked with a couple of other people that were doing the blender. And I kept hearing about this guy, Chet Nairn, Chester Nairn, who was the best blender pitch man ever and had been a guy that had worked the fairs and shows with the Indian makeup and had done the, you know, the thing, all that stuff. So funny. So I said, all right, I got to find him. So I found him somehow and I begged him to go work the Big E with me in Massachusetts. Nice. Now, we couldn't get into the building because Ruby Morris would not let another blender joint into the building. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Makes sense. So we had a tent. Now, I had never worked outside. I didn't know what a tent, how, you would, how to do that. Blenders outside. Blenders Great. outside. So we had a big tent with a <laughs> tent pole, and we shipped the joint there, the booth. We set it all up. I met Chet there, and I do my pitch first, and I get down, and he goes, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> now, I thought I was pretty good. I guess sold 20 blunders, bro. <laughs> I, I, I was pretty good. This was like three or four years later. I mean, I was yeah. really doing well. You're actually making money. Yeah, you're actually eating off of this. Yeah. yeah. So he gets up there and he starts out by going, there comes a time in every man's life when he has to go to work. And it looks as though that time has arrived for me. So if I can gather together two or 3,000 or less. And from the looks of things, it's going to be a lot less. I'll show you some of the unusual characteristics of these machines. 
Now, I like to start out with what I refer to as the easy job first, dry grinding. And I was blown away mm -hmm. because this was, what was he talking about? What was he doing? Yeah. But what he was doing was he's doing what we call the bally, which is to get people to stop. It's the snake gambit, the same thing he did for yeah. the medicine man, the aspirin one. Yep, exactly. Right there. That's so sick. Yeah. So I worked with him for those 17 days. I worked another fair with him. And he didn't tell me I couldn't have everything, but I did steal everything. I still do. If I was doing the blender pitch today, it's word for word, mm -hmm. his demo. And it's a 45-minute long demo, not a 20-minute wow. long demo like everybody else. Wow. <laughs> but his closing rate was huge. So at the end of 45 minutes, he wouldn't sell just two or three machines. He'd sell like five, 10, 15. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this for the rest of my blender life. And that's the pitch that I do on QVC. Wow. That's the Vitamix pitch. I don't start it out that way, but I'm still doing exactly the giant hand pulls everything down. I'm still doing exactly what he taught me. And I learned from him <laughs> 35 years ago, 40 years wow. ago. Wow. Mm. It's just one of the things that's so cool and I think unique about this is that the products can continue to evolve and change, but the way to make them appeal to people and to get people to reach for their wallets hasn't changed and probably won't until humans evolve to a different form because it's like that's what gets people in, right? You're pushing every button, you're striking every note. And before people know it, they're calling QVC again, mm -hmm. or they're on Amazon yeah. finding it again. They're like, oh, yeah. I already have two blenders. Yeah. Why did I just buy a Vitamix? Mm -hmm. Damn right. it. Damn it. Like, <laughs> it could do so much more. <laughs> yeah. It does so much more. It yeah. does 13 yeah. things, honey. But yeah. Hey, Jen, you're approaching, asking for the job, basically. You're approaching him. Dave. Hey, I want to work for you. Dave. Dave. I want to I want to work for you. I want to work for you. What made you want to do that even before that? What made you want to be like, oh, this is something I can do. Like, I'm interested. Obviously, that's not just like you didn't have an epiphany that day there, but there was something, that's there was a correct. fire in your belly, not to be too cliche. So probably two things. Mm -hmm. First, my history as a kid. And then secondly, being, I mean, broke. Mm -hmm. We took the bus there. We had no car. I mean, I did not know what we were going to do to pay our rent back then. We were renting a house in Lemon Grove for 150 bucks a month. Wow. I mean, if you can imagine a three bedroom, two bath house, 150 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, concerned, are we going to be able to make that payment? Damn. So I needed to find something. I had been a hair cutter. I had been a, an ad salesman for a newspaper. I had been a mason tender. I had done all this different stuff, but I just couldn't find something that I wanted to keep doing. And then the other part is when I was five years old, I saw Myron Florin on the on Lawrence Welk show. He was the accordion player. I know this is hard for you guys to think about that far back. But anyway, he was the accordion player on each week. I saw him and I said to my mom and dad, I want to play that. So they bought me a 12 button accordion and they got me lessons. And I took lessons from five until I was 16. Oh, wow and learned to play the accordion, but not just any accordion. I actually was in the New Power Conservatory of Music Symphony that was all accordions that played Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, wow. Chopin, and we gave concerts because we could you could change all of the <laughs> on the buttons. You could be a violin, you could be an oh, oboe. Oh, yeah, you Jesus. Could be a bassoon. That's amazing. Wow. And then I got a job as a teenager at the Buck Hotel in Philly. I was raised in Philly. And playing Rogers and Hammerstein and Jerome Kern and all that stuff. So I had a feeling for at least being able to be in front of people. Yeah. And then when I was 16, 17, and 18, I spent three years in Wildwood, New Jersey on the boardwalk. Ooh. And my first job on the boardwalk was trying to get people to come over and turn the big wheel. You can win a carton of cigarettes for just five cents. Come on over. <laughs> so Wow. So would you say it was kind of like part of the background in your life. And then it just clicked that you were like, wait a minute, I could be that person yeah. at, at some point. Was it a bit like that? No, exactly. I knew I could do what he was doing. And I was just amazed at the look. Mm. I mean, he just held 50 or 60 or 80 people mesmerized. Mm. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah. mesmerized. I mean, of course they didn't all buy, but I didn't care. I just liked seeing, holy cow. It was extraordinary just to watch. Mm -hmm. I still love it. I still love the blender pitch when you don't see it anymore because nobody's doing it, but yeah. yeah. Vitamix yeah. doesn't do that blender pitch. They don't do that type of a pitch anymore. So right. yeah. sometimes the products get so good that it's almost like, how do you beat it? And I think Vitamix does have a, it's got a little backing of like, this is the end all blender. So it's like the competition's not quite there anymore. So you, you hook your wagon to the right one, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was there from 1990 into 2010, I was always looking for a blender that I could sell on QVC and do the pitch. Mm. And gosh, if I could just get the Vitamix, gosh, if I could just get the Vitamix, but they weren't interested. They were still doing their fair and show business. They're, you know, huge mm. business. Yeah. Plus they had their commercial side. Their commercial side of the business is huge. Oh, and by the way, does anyone know who, who was the person and what was the product and what was the year of the first infomercial? ever on TV. 1949, the Vitamix, oh. <laughs> Papa Barnard. <laughs> All right. This has been another episode of Call Now. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> Hi, man. Wow. Nice Hi, job, man. Dan. Hots and pans. I don't believe it. Good way to go, Dan. <laughs> yeah. That's why they keep me around, Jan. I tell you. That's yeah, Dan, it. Dan's not bad. Mm -hmm. Very. And you know what? We still use the first part of that infomercial as the opening to the Vitamix. Uh -huh. Yeah. If it ain't broke, why fix it? Yeah. Yes. That's incredible. Yeah. Dan, you can yeah. wipe that off your hand now. I know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I had thought about this and I think I first stumbled across that a little more than a year ago, that original Vitamix one. But I was thinking about it because, again, you're someone who obviously understands and appreciates the history and the art of the pitch. Mm -hmm. And it being the original, the first one, that was where I refreshed my knowledge on the date and time. I knew it was Papa Barnard. I knew it was the Vitamix. I brushed up on the 49 in the past week to make sure I was sharp, but it seemed like kind of a natural thing to come into the universe of the products that you've been involved with. Yeah, well, it was up to QVC because in 2010, Vitamix went to QVC and said, we want to bring our blenders to QVC. And we have all of these people to choose from that are selling the Vitamix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they brought in a lot of people. They just kept bringing them in and having them testing them to see if they were going to be able to be on air because on air is different than doing a pitch. Yep. Right. So nobody was working out. And then the manufacturer's rep, who was the go-between middleman between Vitamix and QVC, he's the guy that takes care of all of the orders, what product and you know all the shipping and everything mm -hmm. like that. The busiest guy. Yeah. <laughs> he said, there's two people that can do this and make it successful. Jan Muller and Bob Warden. And Bob couldn't do it because he was with Cook's Essentials, which was QVC's brand. Yeah. Lucky for me, they hired me. And we did that first TSV, Today's Special Value, with Jane Rudolph Tracy in January of 2010. And we sold it out three times that day. Wow. Decent start. Three times. They had no more machines. Actually, they couldn't even ship in any machines. Like for a month or two months later, they just, oh, they wow. had nothing they could even build and do. So QVC was very happy. Vitamix was very happy. I was very happy and it's continued. And it's odd that you could be selling a 400 to $500 blender on QVC regularly for 11 years. And we've sold over 1,100,000, right? That's insane. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that we talk about with a lot of the products, especially coming out of the fair circuit of things where it's always like, keep it in denominations of money people have in their pocket. So it was always like, all right, you know, two payments of 20, that sort of stuff. You want to keep it like, what can you hand me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then to yeah. be able to pivot that to top shelf, it still doesn't make sense to me <laughs> <laughs> on how and why, but I question it. I guess at a certain point, value comes through and it's like, well, forget the number. You have to get back to what are you getting for the number? Exactly. Still scares me, to be honest with you. As Chet would say <laughs> in his pitch, you really do pay for what you get, but then you get what you pay for. That's beautiful. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it is. Shakespeare. And it's kind of like with all clad cookware. You know, they're pans, the cast iron stuff. They're two, three hundred dollars. A set of all clad is like six, seven hundred, a thousand dollars. But you have that cookware the rest of your life, no kidding. Yeah. And it yeah, will pass difference. down to your kids. 
And I've already passed down. I bought my first Vitamix in 1990. That's when they switched over from the stainless steel container to the first polycarbonate container that you could see through. Mm. And it was called the Total Nutrition Center. <laughs> and that machine is still running. It's now been passed down to my daughter. And then she passed it down to someone else because she wanted a new one. So <laughs> it's difficult to burn them out. Yeah. Wow. Mark, we said the same thing about the magic bullets, right? It's the same thing. Yeah. They last for at least one or two drinks, and then yeah. you can pass them right to your garbage man on Monday morning. <laughs> Once you get to ice, it's done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no, I mean, it is. They can't all be winners, right? You don't need a comment. It is a notorious product for just being something you want to pick up at the store because you have a, something and it burns out and you don't think about it. The Vitamix kind of is a lifestyle product. Yeah. Right. Yes. I think nowadays it's like the iPhone is a lifestyle device. Mm -hmm. You spend the money to do it. Consumers have become very open to making those decisions, but I'm going to have this shit forever, you know? Yeah. 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 That's cool. The great thing I love about selling it and I'll sell it for as long as they'll let me <laughs> is that most people are going to use it to make smoothies. Mm. And most people are not going to use it to make nut butter. Some will. Mm -hmm. Most people right. aren't going to use it to make frozen ice cream. Some will. Most people aren't going to use it to make hot soup. A lot of people do. Mm -hmm. But yeah. when they make that smoothie, either every day or every other day, however often they make it, it comes out perfect every single Consistency. time. Consistency. Yeah. 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 On yeah. every model. Mm -hmm. I I work with every single model. In fact, they've got a new model that I'll be debuting in September on QVC. And even that produces a smoothie that is just as good as their big machine. As well. So, I mean, they're phenomenal. You know, it's a privately owned company. It's a family owned company for generations. They just, they do it yeah. right. And we were looking at your resume, which you did some internships with some serious chefs i wouldn't be surprised if you saw oh yeah vitamix is in commercial kitchens probably right right i can tell you a little tale there you know i never get this you know my wife my kids my family my friends by now would have said shut up well we don't <laughs> stop with the we will not stop with the stories no we don't know how to so <laughs> but this is great so, <laughs> so when we were living my wife and i were living in chester springs in pennsylvania and a friend of ours was the person that owned this school called Le Col de Chef. Mm -hmm. And what it was is that you could pay a certain amount of money and you could travel anywhere in the world to like a hundred of the top restaurants and work for a week in the kitchen with the chef. Ooh, so I said, I want to do that. And the first place I want to go is Le Bernardin because I've been there to eat. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. I said, I want to go there with Eric Repair, Chef Repair. Yeah. Are you sure they're going to let me back there? Like, this isn't a goof, right? Like, really? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so, and I'd never been, you know, I'm not a chef, I'm not chef trained. I've never been in a restaurant, you know, working in a restaurant or any of that stuff. I just like to cook. Mm -hmm. So I get there and they introduce me around to the, you know, all the different things. I mean, he has the fresh fish flown in every single day, whole. Every day comes down into the bottom of the restaurant where they're going to gut the fish. They fillet the fish. They do all of it before that restaurant opens up at 11 o'clock for lunch. Every day, fresh fish. Wow. Every day, fresh caviar. Every day. So it was just, it's just extraordinary. Anyway, one of the days I had to work with the saucier and I had seen the Vitamix there. You know, and this is in 2000, 2001, maybe 1999, 2000. So I'm not selling it on QVC, but I, of course I know about it. So he's got the Vitamixes there and he's making this bacon butter sauce that Ooh. is made with two ingredients, bacon and butter. Oh, I was going to guess. All right, man. Okay. No, I'll get on the next one. <laughs> and once it's made, he has to cook the bacon in water. Then he puts it in the Vitamix hole. He puts in the melted butter. He puts in more water. He turns that thing on. In fact, if you watch the chef show, are you guys watching the chef show with John Favreau? And oh, yeah. Yeah, I have seen a few of those. Oh, That's great. Dude, the Vitamix is in almost every show. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he's making his Korean or his Mexican 
sauces and he's got the darn 64 ounce thing filled to the top yeah. in one of the episodes Fabro goes it's not pulling it down it's not pulling it down yeah and his yeah. sidekick says oh yeah i screwed up i put all the solid stuff in first and the liquid on top mm -hmm. it's supposed to yeah. be the other way it's in the manual and so the john says he, call jan he picks yeah. up a spatula <laughs> and turns it over with the wooden part sticking down he says let me just let me just do this. And he goes, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. It. Anyway, <laughs> the saucier makes this bacon butter sauce. It was so good. And I could not believe that he liquefied the bacon. You could not tell. All you got was the essence of the bacon. It was like yeah. he had just done smoke or something. Yeah. Sorry, it's so I got a chance. Each night I would go back. I wouldn't stay for service. I was worn out. <laughs> so I would go back to the hotel. I was staying at it around five. I would take a, a little nap for like 30 minutes and then I would take a shower and I'd go back to the restaurant for dinner and they had a table for me every single night. Wow. Now, I had to pay for dinner. I had to pay for everything that night. What, yeah. But guess what I ordered <laughs> the night we made the bacon butter sauce. It comes, mm. it's a piece of halibut <laughs> that's cooked perfectly. And oh. flown in that morning. And the bacon butter sauce oh. is drizzled around the oh. outside of the halibut. Yeah, look, damn, I'm telling you, I've made it at home. I've made it because it's a simple recipe. You wouldn't believe that it goes so well with fish, but it does. Yeah. yeah. That's that's my bacon butter Vitamix La Bernadette story. Oh my awesome. god. Yeah. That's like bacon wrapped scallops on steroids to the 45th level. Bacon everything. Yeah. I, I mean David Venable with the chocolate bacon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does chocolate bacon, you know, and now they yeah. sell it. Yeah. They had it in the back of the house at the restaurant I worked at, for sure. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, for sure. The Vitamix. I don't know if they did. I think they did chilled soups and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. what they would be using it for. That and sauces. And I kind of remember hearing about the horsepower of it through the Will It Blend YouTube videos. Oh, yeah. That was Tom. Tom Dixon? Tom Dixon. Thank oh, you. Wow. He did Will It Blend with the golf balls and the, you know, the phones and the everything. Yeah. Oh, wow. I remember that. You're just like, oh, yeah. I saw one. I mean, you could talk about all. Oh, he took an iPad broken in half and just put it in there and he liquefied an ipad yes it was like what? oh my god if you think bacon can't <laughs> right <laughs> ipad yeah. is also liquid did you know that? Right. exactly because he put a diamond in it yeah he did yeah he, he ran that for a long time well i loved it they would not let me do it with the vitamix on qvc mm -hmm. i said come on just let me do the golf balls let me do the golf balls nope you got your own set i was gonna say you're like okay now so <laughs> oh yeah what can they tell you yeah. once the light goes well, on it's once there you go <laughs> i can do it just once <laughs> that's it and you can be like you know and we're gonna make a chilean sea bass with a iphone butter sauce so here we go drop that in <laughs> and let it ride you know yeah drizzle around the edge and that would be my last airing oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't do that then all right don't yeah do don't that. do that from the yeah. i mean or or like once you decide so long. I mean, that's a pretty cool way to go. Just you know, throwing that out there too. No, exactly. If I know it's my last bearing, right? But I that, that that kind of thing to bring it back to the infomercial a little bit. We always wonder why people do it and why they don't do it. As to like the ridiculous thing your product can do, yeah. which is always one of our favorite bits. It's just like this vacuum cleaner can pick up a bowling ball. No one would ever do that, but yep. it's so fun for a viewer to see those things yeah. in the same yeah. way. Like you're arguing about the golf balls and it's like, right. it's just like this bit of fun where you're like, Holy crap, this thing could destroy something. I don't want to do that, but it's fun to watch. <laughs> I know. Well, for years I would go to the Del Mar fair and just watch the V slicer and the knife pitch over yeah. and oh, I'd stand there for hours. He'd say, kid, get out of here. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I, you know, but I just loved it. He just, the patter, and, you know, especially watching, I never saw, did I ever see Arnold? I think I saw Tony Notaro. He's another guy you could have on. He's on QVC. Do you know about Tony? Oh, you know, Tony Notaro? Is that Chef Tony? Yeah, Chef Tony Notaro. The man himself? Oh, yeah, yeah sure. I only know him by his stage name, not personally. <laughs> but yeah. Have you had him on? No, 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 we'd love to. We'd love to. Right. If I could also track down the Brown and Crisp bag infomercial, I can't find that anywhere. And these guys don't believe it existed, mm -hmm. where they basically sold just like the crisping sleeve. Because Tony hawked that. I think that was one of the first Chef Tonys I saw before the Miracle Blade and some of the other things that he did later on. I'll never forget the Brown and Crisp. They seem pretty dangerous in hindsight, and maybe they've been abolished for legal purposes, those infomercials. But yeah. yeah right. <laughs> yeah. 
Tony would definitely be a, another trip. All right, cool. Yeah, no, I've got his info, so I'll I'll send it to you. Awesome, mm-hmm. appreciate it. Yeah. And I'll see if I can find Bob Warden. Well, yeah, well, you and Bob, you guys wrote a book together, right? One of your cookbooks was with Bob, right? Yeah, we did because he had been doing cookbooks for QVC for all of the products he was doing for Cooks Essentials, so the slow cookers and the pressure cookers and all that stuff. So he's writing got cookbooks. Got it. Okay. But he had had a very successful cookbook with how to buy in bulk teaching people how to be able to go to places like Costco, Mm. pretty much that's all that's left now, or Sam's, and buy in bulk. So he had that. And I said, well, why don't we do one that's also using different products like the Food Saver and the Vitamix and all that stuff. So that's what we did with that. Cool. Yeah. Commercial purchasing and personal purchasing? No, just personal. Just personal. Okay, Mm. cool. Yeah, exactly. You know, just for people. So they knew what they could do with all of that stuff when they brought it home. Mostly how they could vacuum pack it, freeze it, keep it for six months to 12 yeah. months. And yep. I mean, I don't know how else you can buy 10 steaks unless you got a big family or, <laughs> right. or you know, yeah, right. five pounds of peanuts. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got a bunch of empties to crush, right? You don't want to get the deposit back. That's a different part of the vacuum ceiling. That was my favorite part. Yeah. I was thinking <laughs> when you have your boys over, that's what you could do with 10 steaks. Oh yeah. You need 10 steaks. That's right. When you have At the, least. Guys, the MOD. Yep. Men's only dinner. Yeah. Well, let's spend a little time in the MODs, men's only dinners, where, so you say you're not a chef, but I mean, as a home chef, you must be putting out quite the spread. Can you give us a little bit of insight into what these events look like? Yeah. So the reason I wanted to do it is I moved to Westchester. I was with my girlfriend, Jan, at the time. Her name is Jan as well. And we weren't married yet. And I moved to a condo in Westchester. I was bored. I was lonely. And Bob Warden was there, and Rick Domeyer from QVC was a host, and Bob Bauer Sox, who was the host on QVC at that time. And I was friendly with them at QVC, but I said, you know, I'd like to get to know these guys better, so why don't I just invite them over for dinner, and maybe we can cook together. So I think we made pasta one time together, and then it evolved into like ending up with 40 to 50 guys on the list because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the word got around. <laughs> wow. So the most we ever had, I think the most we ever had for dinner was eight to 10 guys. That would be the most. That's a lot to cook for. Yeah. yeah. I would do braised lamb shanks or I would do paella or something like that along that. But we would always start out with, you know, either cocktails and champagne and appetizers. Somebody would bring apps and I would be cooking all day or three days if it was short ribs. Yeah. And it was always, not always, but mostly around the Philadelphia Eagles football games. So, cool. so it's usually around a sporting event, right? Mm-hmm. It was just great. I was afraid we'd go down this path and you bring up the Eagles. because So the three of us are from Massachusetts, but Mark will be your designated ally. For some reason, he was raised as a Dolphins fan. Dave and I are are big Pats fans. So I did say that we have to let you enjoy What's the Philly special. What's yeah. That? What's a Pats fan? Ooh, ouch. Harsh, yeah. harsh. Yeah. No, no. Ugh. England Patriots Ugh. are clearly, <laughs> clearly the best. Tom, clearly the best quarterback. I mean, come on. I always rooted for them because the Eagles were never in it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but my buddies hated me because we would watch the playoffs. <laughs> we would be cooking and watching the playoffs. And of course, the Eagles wouldn't be in it. Or if they were in it, they went out. And it was always the Patriots. So it seemed like it was mostly the, and they beat us like three points, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. T.O. Because our Uh, quarterback at the time decided to. He had a tummy ache, you know? It happens. Poor Donovan. Oh, he had a tummy ache. Yeah. Broken leg game for T.O. Oh, T.O. was great in that game. He was great. Yeah, he's superhuman. Do you look back fondly on Foles? Or is it just like, is it just kind of like a dream? It just came and went. Yeah, it was because you can't imagine how crushed we were. When Wentz went down, yeah, when Wentz got hurt, and you're just like, right, right. Wentz got injured going for the touchdown. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, yeah. we were. Crying. Yeah, I thought they were dead in the water. We went, oh, this is great. This is great. Of course, this would happen to the Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right. our quarterback right. goes out, yeah. and Folsey comes in and lights it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, understatement. Yep. <laughs> he just went good. He lit it up. Yeah, it was but crazy. that was it. Big Dick Nick. Yeah, man. It was like five games, five to six games. That was it. Done. Super Bowl. Good. Got one. 1950, we won the National Football League with Chet Ben Narek and Tommy McDonald and 
Norm Van Brocklin. Nice. And then we lost in, I think, 82 when... Uh, Jaworski? Yes. Mm-hmm. The Jaworski yeah, years. Probably. Jaworski yeah. years. A little bit of Herm. And who was 92, 90? Who was the guy that coached the St. Louis Rams to all of those? Vermeil. Vermeil. Yeah. Vermeil. He was our coach. Take Vermeil, yeah. So the, and we lost mm-hmm. to the yeah. Raiders. It was great to win, but it's not nearly as good as winning every year. Like the Pats do. Yeah. Yeah. We're spoiled, which is nice. I don't know what it's like, by the way. Yeah, I know. Mark's a Dolphins fan. Where? Miami? Yeah. Yeah. No, you needed to have been born when I was born, and then you would have watched the Miami Dolphins crush everybody. Mm -hmm. 72, 73. (laughs) They were monsters. Mm -hmm. Don Shula, they were monsters. Defense, their offensive line, their backfield. Three amazing running backs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Literally the definition of a juggernaut. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so for the MOD, so they're typically around the sports calendar. Do you have like rotating guest lists, like depending on the sporting event? You're like, all right, these are my guys for the Kentucky Derby. These are the guys for the Super Bowl. These are the Masters crew. No. It kind of comes down to your best three or four buddies. Yeah. Amen. And then if you want more <laughs> than that, you'll put out an invitation. But I have three guys on the East Coast that have been my friends for 15, 20, one guy, 21 years, Tony and Angelo, and then Miguel. I'm going back in August and we're going out for a dinner, nice. but it'll be a men's only dinner. Love it. Still food, still guys. That's great. Still counts. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. Just guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You need that. You need a little reprieve. Mention the lamb, mention the short ribs. What would you say is your best dish, whether it's for MODs or in general when you're cooking at home? If you had to just dial up your best Jan Muller, your last dish to go at, at your place, what would it be? I would probably make risotto. Yeah, You're not going for anything easy. <laughs> oh, it is. It's, um, it's not that hard. It really isn't. Patience. And you can add anything to it. You can make anything out of it. If I was going to make a last MOD, it would probably be lamb shanks because the guys always tell me they love that the best out of everything I made for them over 10 or 15 years. The most requests was, please make the lamb shanks. Mm. Oh, nice. It's got to be lamb. Lamb shanks with the polenta or the mashed potatoes or yep. bush. That's one of my menu tests at a restaurant is what they serve with short ribs. If it's a polenta, you should get the short ribs. If it's a potato, maybe pass. That's one of my smell tests I try to do. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yep. No science behind it. Just my own biases. No, but, no, you know, I got it. No, polenta. <laughs> Instinct. Oh. Yeah, I'm like, they're putting in the time and effort to do polenta. Not mashed potatoes. It's definitely not coming out of a bag. So I'm in. So uh, all you guys, <laughs> you're not all in the same area then, are you? We all grew up in the same area in the beautiful Berkshires out in Western Massachusetts. Oh, cool. And we've all kind of spread across the state. So I'm mm-hmm. out um, just south of Boston. Dave's not too far from the Big E in Central Mass. Yeah, I go every year, actually. Yeah. Good. Do you watch the Pitchman? So that was, it's funny because Dan orchestrated this whole podcast that we do. And then once we saw Pitch People, it triggered in me. I go, I've seen these guys. Holy shit. (laughs) The Big E, I sat and watched them. And I think these days there's less Pitchman, but they're there. It's nothing like in Stan's movie where he's talking about, well, Atlantic City. I don't think it's anything like that. Yeah. But I know that that one, it's funny you mentioned the tent because friends of mine had a product where they got put in a tent (laughs) outdoors once and they were like, oh, we're screwed kind of, but they actually had a really high traffic area and a good product. Yeah. 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 But it's funny because it's very political. You know, like I can see how someone was like elbowing you out (laughs) if they had the opportunity, but I love the biggie. Yeah. Ruby had the Vitamix in the building. He's gone. No, there's no way. Sorry. Yeah. Incredible. I was glad that we even got into the fair because, you know, yeah. it's tough. The fair managers don't like to duplicate products, even if it's completely different price point or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They like to keep just one product in each thing. So you won't see more than one Ginsu knife. You'll see more than one booth. Yep. But you would rarely ever see Be two. The, yep. uh, the Miracle Blade and the Ginsu knife. You would rarely see that together yep. at a fair. And did you, yeah. like in Stan's movie, did you guys stay on site in an RV hotels hotels, hotels. Yeah, yeah. oh that's yeah, the yeah. lovely lovely yeah. life of a pitch man oh god oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah i started out in an RV cuz i worked with my wife with blenders the first 4 years with our kids mm-hmm. and we rode around the entire country in an RV with a wow. great dane wow. in a rocking chair and two kids incredible wow. a great dane in an RV amazing yeah yeah that's a movie <laughs> oh it's <was Yeah>. fun <laughs> that's a hustle that's a movie. yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's nuts. So while we're on the topic of the state fairs live pitch, so they have 10 rapid fire questions for pitch people. The first one is, what is the best state fair or live demo that you ever saw? Hands down, it's the Ginsu Knives. 
Mm. Hands down, it's yeah. the Insu- with Arnold or Tony mm. Nataro. Yeah. yeah, just yeah. patter is it's too much. And it's art too. So we someone recently covered when Arnold was selling Ron's knives, the Showtime Six Stars. Oh, yes, right. And <laughs> I mean, and it's the same picture that Arnold did for 70 years and it was yeah. perfect, it was phenomenal, but it's like also like the hands, right? Cooking while talking, obviously very difficult, but also slicing while talking as a key component was like, yeah, that's a different sport. And to be that good at it, it's insane. <laughs> no, it's, he had hands that were as light as feathers. I mean, and he was a big guy. Yeah. yeah. You know, he had big beefy hands and he would just, it was, it was the best. Yeah. Hard on for me anyway, that was the best pitch and the best one to watch. Yeah. Who was the best pitch person who never made it? Well, a, a lot of the pitch folks tried to get, on to QVC and they would get on, but they weren't able to tone down their pitch. They weren't able to make it as an on-air guest. Mm. So they wouldn't let the host interact with them. They would just, they were had their head down and they were going to finish. Yeah, they had to go. Yeah. This thing. So (laughs) I don't have anyone in particular. A lot of people just never went after it. Yeah. You know, I again did it because actually at that time I was pretty much close to being broke in 1990 when I started with the paint stick and then got on to QVC. Changed my life and the life yeah. of your family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and what was the best, say, for a live demo that you ever did? That's hands down the blender. Yeah. yeah. Hands down. Yeah. What I do now on QVC is a really much smaller version of that 45-minute pitch, right? Because they're not going to let me talk for 45 minutes. I just loved it. That was my favorite thing to do. And I did it for, <laughs> as I said, 15 years, 16 years. Yeah. That's awesome. Like you said, it was like crafted over other people's pitches and what you've seen and how the game evolved at that point. Like there's a special potion, the thing that you built there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 And that goes back to all those people that taught me and were good enough to teach me as a blunder pitch man, a different way of possibly doing it or saying it. Yeah. And why would you add it this way? Why would you add in the raisins? Well, you know, you want to, you want to talk about sugar <laughs> and how bad white sugar is for you. So you put in the raisins to make it sweet, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Wait, did I send you these beforehand? Because my next one was pitch person you're most influenced by. Person I was most influenced by. I'd have to say Dave Sterling because he gave me mm-hmm. the shot at being in the business. Yeah. Yeah. Open that door. That's awesome. Probably well tread ground, but favorite product you ever pitched on TV specifically? Still in the blender? Or was there something else for any of the commercials or infomercials or QVC that you just love? I'd say food saver. Food saver. Yeah. You know, I sold out on QVC until I, you know, had to just let it go. Yeah. So I sold out on QVC for almost 16 years. That and wow. space bags. I love doing that one too. Yeah. Those are cool. Yeah. Both. Yeah. yeah. All right. Crowd or no crowd? Um, <laughs> No, not for an infomercial. I knew it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no crowd. Sorry. I knew it. Yeah. Don't. No. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Makes sense. What was the worst product that you said no to? Uh, so something that got dropped in your lap and you were like, Mm-mm. <laughs> and you were right. It looked like a turd and it was a turd. <laughs> there's too many to say. And if anybody's <laughs> listening, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> All right. I mean, you don't have to be specific, but okay. We, we can jump past two. Yeah. The positive other side of that coin is what is the product that turned out to be most successful that you said no to and ended up regretting afterwards? Oh, let me think. Everybody has had one, I think, so far. Yes. Yeah. But I've never yeah. said no to something I liked. Yeah. So I can't think of a product that I turned down. One snuck by you. Yeah. That then became, no, I don't have one. Wow. Okay. You'll wake up in the middle of the night and it'll be (laughs) the iPhone or something. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) This guy, Steve from Seattle, called me and I was like, get out of here. (laughs) So what would be the one infomercial or product that you wish you could have been the pitch man for? Many. Yeah. If you had to put one at the top or even a Mount Rushmore. There's many that were really great products that I would have loved to have been able to do. Mm-hmm. But like the Bowflex? I'd love to do a vitamin infomercial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I keep asking them, you know, bring it back. That's a hundredth anniversary of the company since they started in 1931. Oh, wow. mm-hmm. And the Vitamix was invented in 1937. So bring it back. Like they got to hurry because I'm getting up there. <laughs> I think you got a few more good rounds in you. And then the last one we have, because we are fascinated by Ron Popeil and just kind of the, I wouldn't call it a shadow that he casts over the industry, but he's kind of like this looming figure 
who did things his own way, does things his own way. Everyone like speaks of Ron, but not necessarily to him. So I'm always curious to know if you had or have had any interactions yeah. or anything with Ron. Yeah, several, because I ended up selling the Ronco rotisserie on QVC. Oh, for him. wow. So when he just decided he wasn't going to come in anymore and yeah. he, his daughter wasn't going to come in anymore. So, But even before that, when he would show up and I saw him pitching in the fair. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. I saw him pitching in the fairs. It had to have been, I guess, in the 80s. Wow or even the 70s, 70s or 80s. Yeah. And then I talked with him many times backstage at QVC. He was always delightful, always a great guy, always very pleasant. He was a fantastic guy to the hosts. I mean, the hosts at QVC that were working with him when he was there, it was like Santa Claus coming to town. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So yeah, he was great. And I think what I loved most about him was he was an inventor. Mm -hmm. So yeah. not necessarily the greatest pitch man. I would probably say Arnold Morris, maybe the greatest pitch man. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as far as being an inventor, mm -hmm. inventing your product, getting it made, bringing it to market and selling it, yeah. there's nobody better than him. I think that's why he wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman Ever in the 20th Century. Yeah, Salesman of the Century. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think also it was his voice. If you listen to Ron talk, right. his voice <laughs> has a particular timber. It's so soft, but it's commanding. It's just his nature. It's just the way he is. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I always enjoyed my time hanging out with him. That's awesome. Yeah. We've said that too, where it's almost, it's like a preacher's tone to a degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's also, it's yeah. hypnotic. So you mentioned that too, when you were talking about Chet a little bit earlier, how you just kind of, people are just drawn in mm -hmm. and they're just coming forward and they start to reach for their wallets almost unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And Ron definitely has that alluring, almost echolalia sense about him. And you're just like, oh, what do you have? Mm -hmm. Sure. 20 bucks and you're going to keep mailing me stuff. Yeah. This is incredible. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think we've fallen into and diagnosed the same thing of Ron's magnetism yep. in the way that it comes through well said. audibly and like i like listening to his audiobook because it's just three hours of ron talking about ron, ron. It's like <laughs> 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 and how well did nancy do working with him better than any other host well that's the thing that's wild is he goes from nancy and not to disparage anyone else that you may have worked with but you can't really get a much stark difference from host from nancy to steve bryant Right. Where in like, oh, exactly. Right. It's like, you know, Steve does his job. He's there, but like, Steve, you're over there with Nancy. It's like, oh, Nancy, you're going to ask him another question. This is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. How is chocolate pasta going to be good? I don't know either, Nancy. Go, go find out. Like, she's <laughs> just, you're right. It's just like that, that natural warmth yes. that kind of radiates from her. Where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah I, I was thinking that. Like, she's just, and it doesn't come across as like asking dumb questions to like prop up a pitch. It has that level of sincerity where it's like, oh, exactly. even if she's not actually interested, it feels like she is. That's really cool. And she is. <laughs> she actually is. Do we do we have time for a quick Steve Bryant story? <laughs> we have yeah. unlimited time. We're on your schedule, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Steve was one of the hosts I worked with, one of the only hosts I remember from the early 90s on QVC that I worked with, who was, he was just wonderful to be on air with. Because he would go back and forth. Many of the hosts, they didn't want to do it together. They want to get in there. Yeah. So anyway, I was selling the Bamex and I was doing the non-fat whipped topping. And in the pitch, you know, you just turn it over and the whipped topping, you know, stays there. And then you, you know, put in the strawberries or whatever and you have the dessert. So I went, yeah, you know, look at this and, you know, and that's, look at that. And I put it over his head. And of course, this is the one time it didn't set. <laughs> Is that available? Is that video out there? <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I doubt it. But and he was so gracious, <laughs> so good about it. He just picked up some napkins. Don't worry about it. Show us something else, Jan. And while I was doing something else, what a pro! Thinking, yeah, thinking that I have now again lost my job. <laughs> so, <laughs> he just said, "Show us something else," and I just showed something else, and then he came back on he was all ready to go and he was just he was a peach wow. that's amazing that's great yeah <laughs> we could go for days weeks and years about this stuff i don't know if mark or dave you guys had any questions that you needed to ask jan about i guess i want to just go back to pitch people as my capstone to this interview right here i don't think i understood 
the game, the life, the art of it until I saw that. And I think you were a big part of kind of breaking that barrier for me. 100%. I'll never turn back on people who sell and have a passion for a script and a product and a company as a whole. And I I appreciate you for all that you've done. Yeah, I'm thrilled with it. And so something about not just the uh, movie, but pitch people in general, hardest job Mm. I ever had. Mm. Ferry opens at 10 o'clock. You better be ready to go. It closes at 10 o'clock at night. You work for those 12 hours. You then have to clean up everything. You then go out and eat jackpot around with other pitch people and cut up a jackpot is what it's called. And you're sitting and you're, you know, having a beer and having a hamburger or whatever. You get home at 12 or one o'clock, get up the next day at seven or eight because you got to shop for your groceries. If you don't have everything, you got to get in there. You got to prep everything, get ready for the day. Door opens at 10 o'clock. And there were two fairs that were back to back 15 days. It was Pleasanton and Santa Rosa. And you had to tear Jesus. down Pleasanton at 10 o'clock at night, load up your van, put the joint in there, every, all the product and everything, drive to Santa Rosa, which was, I don't know, four or five hours up in the Bay Area and set up for the next day to open at 10 a.m. Wow. So, and that's how everybody was, you know, except for the guys that were, you know, the stars, you know, like Arnold and a couple of other people that didn't have to, you know, do the setup and all that stuff. But even they, I mean, it's a hard job, even if you're pitching just six hours a day on and off of the 12 hour day. Yeah. Because you're then writing orders or you're prepping or you're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're working, you're working 12 hour days. That's wild. Man. The grind is real, man. The grind is real. You're right. Thanks for grinding. We love it. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. We'll get you out of here on the topic of the jackpot. Two booze-related questions. So <laughs> first one is you mentioned that you are a wine enthusiast. So out of curiosity, what is your favorite varietal? Oh, mamma mia. If I'm drinking with my wife, it's Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. If I'm drinking okay. with the guys over dinner, it's Cabernet and Bordeaux. Okay. And what is your best bottle under a hundred bucks? Yeah, you can. I have killer bottles of wine that are 25, 30 bucks. I have some that are 15 mm. that are just delicious. Well, see, this is really just me trying to get back in the wine game. I've been slacking. I've been drinking too many beers. So I've been trying to get back in the Cabernet world. They, they don't stick to me as badly. So listen, Cabernet and Bordeaux are the two toughest varietals to actually be able to drink. Because they all take time in the bottle. Ah, Pinot Noir, okay. Chardonnay, Shiraz, Sauvignon Blanc, pretty much any other grape you can drink almost on release. Mm. Ah. Cabernet, it's very tough to find something that you can drink on release unless it's meant to be able to be drunk on release. Right, but right. you can buy really great Cabernets for 30, 35, 40 bucks. And you know, within six months or a year, you could start drinking them. All right. All right. That's the problem yeah. with most people. They buy Cabernet or Bordeaux and it's got so much tannin, they never go back to it. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. No, but that's how you can pretend that you're doing something healthier. Like, no, that's because it's it's good for me. See any oxidants that mm. are they're doing that. It's, it's a cleanse. <laughs> Dan, you brought up beer before yeah. and I want to tie this back into the paint stick. You ever hear of the beer stick? Or the beer machine? Well, yeah. So we know about that. I know the beer machine. Remember the beer machine? I've never heard of the beer All stick, right. so I'll stay with you on this. I actually think we were going to go there anyways. But the beer stick, think about not having the roller on the end of the paint stick, right. just kind of shooting 24 ounces of beer in your mouth <laughs> in like two seconds. It's like a beer syringe, and it looks similar to the, the paint stick. Do you live up there in Massachusetts? I do. Okay, good. So you've been to way too many Pats games. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a tailgater's dream. That's it. it. Yeah. That's like the guy with the hard hat and the two oh. tall boy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Or the water bottle on the back of his back. Mm-hmm. The camel back in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the camel yeah. back. Yeah, Mark, you're right. And Jen, the last thing I had a question about was the beer machine. So, I mean... It was a little bit of ahead of its time, right? Absolutely. It's funny. I told these guys five years ago, I was like, this is a craft beer bubble. I'm like, these breweries are all going to sink. This is ridiculous. I don't know how they're all getting loans. And now I'm like, I'm going to go drive four hours and go spend a few hundred dollars for craft beer. I'm like, I'm obviously wrong and I'm contributing to continuing to be wrong. Exactly. But the beer's delicious. But yeah, <laughs> the beer machine, I saw that and I was like, where was this? Yeah. I know. And it just barely worked. It was too soon. <laughs> It just barely worked. It made great beer, but we just couldn't get enough people to buy it. Yeah. And then there's this other one. The last one I'll leave you with is the Nouveau 
water conditioning system. Have you seen that? No, I, mm -hmm. so. I haven't explored okay, it. Okay, because it's Nuvo, N-U-V-O, water conditioning system. And I shot this, I guess, about 10 years ago with Ronnie Lynch. And Ronnie also shot the uh, Flavor Wave, the Flavor Wave oven where we took a turkey up on the top that was frozen solid <laughs> and dropped it off yep. the ship, right? <laughs> so we shot the Nuvo in Salt Lake City at least 10 years ago. It's still running. In fact, my daughter just saw it the other night. She said, Dad, I was out. <laughs> <laughs> this water can dip. You look so young. <laughs> <laughs> Said I was. <laughs> like, that was almost a compliment, mm -hmm. maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> well, listen, your, your children, you know, they always get a pass. Yeah, yeah I guess. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Oh, man. So, yeah, we have to check out the Nouveau. But, yeah, were you before or after Mr. T became part of the picture for Flavor Wave? I was before. <laughs> That's where they had to go from you, Jan. That's how you set the bar. They had to go to yeah. Mr. T. That's yeah, I did two or three <laughs> different versions of the Flavor Wave. They all worked. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I also was involved with, I heard Dan talking about the Jet Stream Oven with oh, yeah. Dave Dornbush. We went up there, American Harvest. The first cyclonic air. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Bob Warden did that infomercial, but I don't think it ever worked. Again, mm. maybe too soon. People just yeah. couldn't believe it. And now they're calling it air fryer. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. All the air fryers, all that is labor waiver, a jet stream oven. Mm. Yeah. We're yep. well aware. <laughs> I know. The branding of that is just next level. Yeah. I'm talking to the three aficionados of infomercials alive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's and quite then, a mantle. We need your help to get there. So we'll keep <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's going to be oh, trending yeah, soon. Yeah. You guys are there. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, hey, feel free to, you know, let us slip out on QVC sometime. You know, it wouldn't hurt our feelings at all. <laughs> but thank you so much, Jen, for the generosity of your time, for hanging out with us. It's been great to meet and catch up with you. And hopefully we can do this again sometime. Maybe the next time we break down one of the pieces of infomercial history from your past, okay. we can check in again and you get some real behind the scenes insight from you. You guys are uh, delightful to be with, Dan, Dave, and Mark. So this has been a great time for me to uh, spend with you. And unfortunately, I'll never be able to do it again. Yeah, well, you know, it happens. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Times are tough. I get it. Yeah. They're striking the set behind you, Jan. We, yeah. They know exactly. that you don't belong in there, so we'll let you go. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the owners of the apartment are back. Get out. No. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, for, first of all, for actually starting this whole gig call now. Mm. Yeah. Thanks to Stan Jacobs. For you guys yeah. asking him if he could get in touch with me to uh, do this. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I love it. I think it's great because the infomercial business is like a the stepchild or the hidden business of the world. And yet... yeah. It makes the economy all over the world run mm. because look at the yeah. channels that have started. QVC started in 1986, I guess HSN around that time, but you know, they're just going strong and what they are is just 24 hour infomercials. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's one of those yeah. things too, where it's like a lot of people, they might not recognize or remember some of the pitch people by name. But if they ever get a glimpse of one of them that they watched, they're like, oh, yeah. Oh, that. Oh, oh, that. That one's like, yes, that's that's Jan Moore. Like, oh, the 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 roll with the paint stick. Yeah. They're like, oh, my God. I love that. It's like, yeah. See, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> it's like living the subconscious kind of. It's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. And for sure. some of us, it's a little bit more intrusive. And that's, you know, my therapist and I are talking about it. Well, mm -hmm. we'll get yes, through this. You know, anybody that wants to do an infomercial, you know how to reach me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's do it. There we go. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it, brother. Yeah. Take Thank care, you. guys. See you, man. Yep. It was All good right. talking to you. Well, there you have it. He's a legend for a reason. Jan Muller. Fortunate enough to sit down and talk with him. I'm glad he put me on the spot, too. He made me tell him the bit that I'm so proud of and that had an impact on my obsession and getting into things. A lot there that we learned. I think the favorite thing that I took away was the word jackpot, mm -hmm. which is when all the pitch people at the end of the day at a fair or on the circuit are, you know, going out and spend a little bit of money. I just love the term jackpot. We're not invited to the jackpot. No, you're not. Maybe now we will. I am. You guys aren't. No, I think we can all go. <laughs> I'm bringing the beer stick. No. Nah. I'm going to start yeah. chugging beers with my buds. What would you have done, Mark, if he pulled a beer stick up from below out of frame? <laughs> he says, boom. He just bangs it against the wall he does it in a second <laughs> he threw it on the ground and stomped on it so that was a missed opportunity by me oh space yeah. age technology yeah. yeah when he was talking about not wanting to touch anything that was plastic and i would be like, did she stomp on it first mm -hmm. i love that the paint stick origin story but i couldn't believe 
that story about painting the same wall and then waiting for it to dry. Oh my oh. god. That's like the nightmare production mm. scenario. 25 hours of fucking shooting. <sighs> he had us all confused that before he told us there was a number two. I was like, what? wow, they cut yeah. that shit together so well. Yeah, I know. One wall, but yeah. They must have. I bet they ran into like, they were like, oh no, we're in way over our heads. What do we do? And they're like, well, how long yeah. do we have it rented for? And they're like, I don't know, until 10. And then like, well, nobody's going to be here from 10 to 6 in the morning. Why don't we just stay here and keep shooting it? Tell the cleaning staff to go home. They're getting paid anyways. Like, yeah. What? It's like, we're not going to make a mess because this thing doesn't. Yeah. The next crew came in and they were like, have you guys been here all night? It smells like shit in here. <laughs> they're just crying. <laughs> smells like eggs, but we didn't bring breakfast. What happened in here? Don't worry about it. How could paint smell eight times as painty? How could (laughs) chocolate paint smell that bad? Yeah. The continual love affair for Dame Nancy Nelson continues. Really? Yeah. Common thread. Yeah. Underdog. Steve Bryant's a great guy. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, you know what I think it probably is, (laughs) is one, you can't judge people by their social media. And two, probably the people who make it in this business actually do have to be pretty fucking good. Yeah. Despite what we might think about them for some of their antics or the way they come across. Would um, Ron Popeil call him a good friend and a great guy? Who, Jan or Steve Bryant? Steve Bryant. No. He did everything he could to not say no when Steve said. Steve said, I'm lucky enough to call him a close personal friend. Ron's like, very lucky. And he's like, oh, yeah. kill Ron's mic. Edit that out. Yeah. On ADR that out. <laughs> Ron's like, where's what I said about Steve? Like, no, no, no. Oh, oh a tape got caught. Man. So that's something I missed in the research was the Showtime rotisserie handoff on QVC went to Jan. Mm. He's basically passed the mantle. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm very disappointed in you, Timothy. That was a pretty sweet revelation. It's like, oh shit. Not only did he know Ron, like, I feel like there's more weight there that mm. Ron trusted Jan to sell the Showtime rotisserie. Yeah. Like, oh, that's the fucking flagship of mm. Ronco. I don't know. That felt like a more of a thing than I was prepared for it to be. <laughs> more like Janco at this point. Jenkos. Oh. Covered everything. Yep. Covering everything I'm writing down. It's awesome. Well, yeah. And one funny part of it was where Jan started to tell one story and he laughed and said to us, This is where my family tells me to shut up. This is great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which on brand. For us. Well, yeah, right? Well, I think that's part of it where the concept of they've done something, especially guys like Jan, he's done something that very few people can honestly say that they've done. He's not a household name, but he's on TV in everyone's household every day. He's in everyone's historical Rolodex of what the word infomercial means. Even if you don't picture him first, you'll probably remember the vacuum sealing one or that paint roller thing for him and people in the space big holy shit someone wants to hear all this stuff because it is nuts the way that it all builds up right and his story of being i mean so guys we'll peel back the curtain netflix series called pitch people each one is you break down a pitch person and tell their whole backstory so Jan might get two or three episodes because you can start in Nam, work your way forward to living in an RV with a great day and your wife and your two kids doing the 100 city pitch circuit for five fucking years. Mm. And then leading to now where he's like in his rented apartment studio on the West Coast near his home. I feel like there's a there's a line to pull there. I don't know. Shout out Netflix. Yeah. Stan can produce it. He's got all the footage. But yeah, the backstory of him... It seemed like, right, there was definitely a hunger, but like, no, he's like, it was fucking desperation. Mm -hmm. I was broke. And I begged the dude to let me sell fucking blenders at a state fair. Mm. So we've talked to three people in the business so far. Americans. Three Americans so far. (laughs) We're three Americans. We've talked to three, you know, red-blooded Americans. Who wins in a game of three-on-three? The three of us versus Tom, Jan, and Stan. Uh, We do. Well. I'm not going into the paint if Tom's protecting the room, though. (laughs) <laughs> I wouldn't sleep on Stan either. Stan's, he had pipes in that one photo. Yeah. And he's also that unassuming guy with the sweet mid-range game mm, yeah. that you just you forget to guard getting back on defense. You're like, did that guy just take me off the court because he went six for six? <laughs> yeah. And getting crafty. Stan, after the game, he beats you. He's like, hey, I got to tell you something. He's like, you got to work on your head fake. Yeah, right. They'll give you like a little... <laughs> right. 
A little something like that. He's like, you telegraphing where you're heading. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I'm picturing him <laughs> doing some weird baseline stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and wearing a headband. Pull up jumpers. Getting crafty on the oh, baseline. Okay. You know? Just does the mic and drill before. It's good yeah. at the baseline. Yeah. I loved how much <laughs> Jan obviously appreciates all the people he looked up to, all the people he's worked with. And then it just got me thinking as he was like going back in his career, kind of jumping around to like tell his whole story. And then he's sitting in the room where he has to produce his own shit. And he's talking about how many years he's already been doing this stuff. And I'm like, this guy is still adapting. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, and then I look back at Tom and I'm like, Tom's, oh, Tom's showing us his studio after we get off the shit. And after Dave leaves, obviously, because Dave leaves first when we talk to guests. What's wrong, Dave? He hey. just leaves with the guests. That's what it is. That's what it is. Tom's showing us his shit in there. And then throughout the whole interview with Stan, he's pulling out, you know, this product, this product. He's got pitch movie, like, it's life. It's a disease. I, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> three for three. I'm looking at my power steamer, my QRB, my controller, my Hammer X putter. So I can relate. I mean, I've only lost money on this. And these guys have all made money off it. So maybe I'm doing something wrong? I'm just finishing my QRB. Ooh. Nice. Is that what's in that can? It's a good $15 bottle of QRB. That's cool. That's cool. Another outcome from this is, I don't know. I don't think we can really change the Ronnie's. But I do think maybe the turkey meatloaf award is going to get retired and just become the men's only dinner. Oh, man. M-O-D. Yeah. Well, right. I think that that was a delight. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. All right. Bye, guys. I found your apartments. Bye. Thank you all for tuning in. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, or follow on your preferred podcast medium. And for all things Call Now, visit callnowpodcast.com. And if you want to connect with the boys, you can find them at Call Now Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, or send them an email at callnowpodcast at gmail.com. And if you can't fight the urge to pick up the phone and call now, you can leave them a voice message at 617-356-7439. If you call in the next 30 minutes, you might just be the next star of Call Now. Thanks again for listening. We hope you tune in next time to Call Now.